Okay, uh, GoVX, African Focus, Uranium Developer. Uh, I forget the slides to work. There we go. Right, so we have a very large resource. Uh, we started the company in 2007 in Niger, uh, did 650,000 meters of drilling there, took that all the way from exploration through to permitted project by 2016, did two large transactions uh, in Zambia and Mali to add to our resource base. We have only advanced projects. Two of them are fully permitted. Uh, all three projects have gone to PFS. Um, so we have therefore got a strong pipeline. This is about going into production with an improving market. We are only Africa focused. We like working in Africa. One of the key reasons is you can get things done. Uh, in Niger, 60 to 70 percent of the country's exports is uranium. It's a country that relies on its budget in uranium, so working in that industry is pretty straightforward. West Africa is governed by West African business law, or harder. It's pretty straightforward. It covers everything there. So you have rule of law. Um, and all of our jurisdictions are mining jurisdictions. So the ability to source local labor uh, is also key in the way that we operate. We only have four people in the whole company who have non-African passports. We have no South African passports in that, by the way, just to make that clear. All right, so just a bit on the market. You have got to believe in the Iranian market. You've got to believe in the nuclear growth going forward. Certainly since 2011, there's been a structural change. We went into a period of uh, decreasing nuclear generation post Fukushima. That is now turning around. We have nuclear generation now back at the same levels as it was pre-Fukushima, predominantly driven by restarts out of Japan and by Chinese build uh, and Indian build coming through. We now have the fastest growth rate of reactor builds we've had in the last 25 years. Um, you have got the WNA and the United Nations Energy Council both pointing out that if you want to keep global temperatures as required by the Paris Agreement under 2 degrees centigrade by 2050, you have to put in place 1,000 gigawatts of power from nuclear. You will not achieve it with renewables. The speed of renewables coming in isn't fast enough. You're also looking at China currently building eight reactors a year, um, so a substantial growth rate. They're currently going from 4% to 20% of total generation under nuclear, so a strong growth. What they're also doing is accelerating and developing on cost and speed of de deployment. So they're getting quicker and cheaper at doing it as well. This doesn't include small modular reactors as well, which both the US government, China, the Russian government, and the Canadian government are all pushing very aggressively with the first commercial SMR due in two years from now. Uh, these are 10 to 300 meg reactors rather than the 1.3 gig reactors that are there. Every forecast you look at, out there, this is Exxon, BP, IEA, everybody has got growth in energy generation. I think what's more surprising from this chart is the continued expectation that hydrocarbons will make a major part of where we're trying to go. To get to um, less than two degrees, you've got to go zero, net zero uh, carbon emissions going forward. This chart shows how difficult that's going to be. But in this, strong growth in nuclear, particularly out of China um, and particularly out of the Asian market, with steady state coming out of Europe and out of the US. Um, so we've got good growth, good demand going forward. I think culturally things have changed. Uh, the Green Deal came out here in the US, very quickly had to backtrack to say that nuclear had to be in it. Uh, in Germany now, you have pro-nuclear marches. Poland's just written to the German government asking they do not close their reactors. So you are having a change of scope going on here. The problem we had post-2011 as well was that, as you can see on the green bars in here, from 2011 to 2016, uranium production actually increased while uranium demand was dropping at the same time. That was predominantly driven by Canada and Kazatomprom. Canada had brought in um, Cigar Lake. Um, that is still operating. but. Ca Cameco have now shut MacArthur River to about 18 million pounds, about 10% world demand. And Kazat and Perom have been pulling their volumes down as well to try and tighten up the market. The other issue going forward is that the current uranium price does not justify new production coming on. Over the next five to 10 years, you've got about 20% of world production closing. These are older mines that have reached the end of their mine life. So you do have a lot of material going to be coming off the market. The first of them on here is going to be Niger. Common Act was announced for closure next year, uh, not when it was going to be due in 2023. So these projects are slowly disappearing, and you need a much higher price 
to keep things going. Secondary is also declining. Um, the conversion process has a lot of, lost a lot of capacity. Uh, that is reducing the amount of underfeed material that's coming through, enrichment material that's coming through. That's tightening it up. Uh, governments are ending up, particularly the US government has constrained the amount of its sales that were going through that were used for environmental cleanup. Uh, also, volumes are reducing as well that are available for sale out of the government. So those volumes are declining going through. Governments continue to hold a lot of inventory. Inventory levels are declining. Um, if you look at inventory levels in the US for the third year in a row, they're down. Europe is down for four years in a row now, um, back to more normalized levels of where they need to be. But the bigger problem coming, as you see between 2005 and 2012, on the left-hand chart, this was a massive contracting period when prices were running. That Those were five to 10-year contracts. The problem, if you've got on the chart on the uh, right-hand side there, is those contracts over the next couple of years are unwinding. About 20% of materials bought on the spot market, 80% is bought under contract. The major contractors out there, companies like Cameco, will not contract at the current price. Cameco has made it clear that their MacArthur River will not come back on operation until they can secure long-term contracts around $50. So with them and uh, the Kazakhs, they basically put the market into deficit. Cameco have a program this year of buying 14 million pounds. The spot market is 20 million pounds. Uh, they were looking for a material the other day for a million pounds that could only find 300,000. Cameco are actually not buying at the moment. In the US, we have Section 232. The US producers of uranium have asked for protection. They want a higher quota and pricing to allow them to get into production. That is currently under review. I have no idea which way that will actually go, and I think it's a gambling game of where that ends up. But what it's actually done is reduce the amount of buying that's going through the market, particularly the US utilities, who have effectively left the market. The trade volumes in both April, May, and this month starting have almost completely gone. So Cameco has basically said, we're not pushing it if the market's not moving. When it moves, we're going to push it very hard to make sure it moves fast. So a lot of that is happening. That is supposed to come through in the middle of July. So that's going to be the real trigger that's going forward. Where does that affect GoVX? GoVX's strategy very much about development, pushing our Maduela project in. It is fully permitted. It's ready to go. Maduela has all the infrastructure. It's next to the Arriva mines, roads, power, people. More importantly, we have a government that's very keen to work with us. They've structured a debt deal with us, cancelling debt to take a small equity position in the company. That valuation values Maduela at $145 million for a company that's trading at $50 million. What we are focused on is bringing our costs down a lot. We've made some major steps forward on technology to reduce our costs and try and reduce our incentive price by at least another $10 so we can get this mine away at $45 contract price, which means we need just over $30 spot price, uh, looking at the norm. So very much the focus of where we're going. It is already permitted. It needs nothing else. We're already working on the debt. We have a, a, a consortium of debt players working on this. The second project is slightly different from our peers is we have the Zambia project. Again, fully permitted, very simple, open pit heat leach operation. All-in costs of Zambia are identical to the all-in costs for Niger. Um, this one could, again, get up going. Zambia, finance minister came out. This is an area they want to diversify from just having copper. Uranium is a big part of that diversification plan for Zambia. So we get a lot of support there as well. Um, as I say, all-in costs for Niger are very similar. Technical team, we've been in this industry for a long time, in and out. I've worked all over the world in different commodities. We have an experienced board. Um, I'm running out of time here. So uh, very liquid stock. We trade about 1% of our free flow every day. Um, we are cashed up at the moment. There is a debt on our balance sheet, but that's going to disappear into the Maduela project and the government ownership structure. So we are going to be pretty well debt free um, going forward. Last chart. This is the re-rate story. You're going from developer to producer. In the last cycle, the best two performing shares were Energy Fuels and Paladin. They went up 4,000 and 10,000% for a sector that went up 2,000%. Why? Because they started brand new operations and went into production. GoVX is one of the few that can actually achieve that. Thank you very much.